Welcome to Hebrew Readers Church. I'm your brother, Kasafo. And I'm your brother, Zakwa. <laughs> Hope you all are enjoying the Shabbat today. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for taking the time to check out the content and continue working on the things we're learning for our growth and building in the faith of Yache Christ. Amen. Hey, brother Zakwa, would you like to say anything? Well, praise the Elohim. We have a great lesson lined up for everybody today. The righteousness of joy with patience. Um, it's going to be a uh, a lesson that has multiple factors, um, but it should be encouraging to to all of us uh, along the walk. And it should give us more edification and more understanding of what we're supposed to be focused on and how we can overcome certain things that may be against us in this walk and things that we may encounter. So um, I think it's a great lesson, and I think um, it's going to help a lot of people. Praise Allah. Amen. All right, let's get into it. So we talked about the importance of listening in the last lesson, Faith Comes by Hearing, but we didn't want to neglect giving understanding of how to take in what we hear so we can receive it on good ground and actually grow from where we are. So, let's set our heart on Allah Hayim today. Can you read Psalms chapter 19, verse 9, please? The fear of Ahaya is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Ahaya are true and righteous altogether. A man that loves him sees it in that perspective, that the fruits of his fear are clean. And when seeking the truth and what's right, the judgments of his words is where the answers to such things are. Right? Can you go on to Sirach chapter 33, verse 2, please? A wise man hateth not the law. He believes it's true and right, identifying how to stay clean from idols so he doesn't view it as something grievous, as that would show he hates it. But he embraces it as it's what he trusts in. Continue verse 3, please. A man of understanding trusteth in the law, and the law is faithful unto him as an oracle. If we truly put our trust in the law, and knowing that the law is spiritual, it will speak to us as an oracle to instruct our steps in righteousness. And here at HRC, that's the standard to hold ourselves to so we can be filled with the fruits of righteousness that come from it because we seek it out of love only. Continue to Sirach 32 and 15, please. He that seeketh the law shall be filled therewith. We have to view it as something to rejoice in because it's converting us from our former ways so it makes us happy in true wisdom understanding ourselves and what's going on within us to overcome it and get the victory over the devil. Can you read Psalms 19 and 7, please? The law of Ahia is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Ahia is sure, making wise the simple. So we want him to identify any faults we have so we can see them and be converted by working on them. It's Halahayim that gives us eyes to see any iniquity that lies within us. For these things, we couldn't see, nor did we understand them. That shows we are being led by him as he sees what all we may have going on within us. Can you read Psalms 98, please? Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. So you can see he actually sees everything. So when he points something out, 
he's gentle. He's going to point it out at the right time. And our trust is shown by taking it as, okay, this is the right time. You wanted me to know this because you want what's best for me. You revealed it in faithfulness that this is something I can overcome because you're going to deliver me. And that's something that you have to trust in Elohim for. Because if Elohim is revealing a secret fault, that means that you can't see it. Or a secret sin is something that you usually can't see. And you have to trust Elohim that he's actually leading you right and actually bringing forth something that you need to work on or be aware of. Not just because you can't see it or you don't understand it, that it, it makes it not true or not valid. So that's one thing to definitely stay away from. And that first mindset, the prideful mindset of where the word cometh and the devil casteth away, mm -hmm. that pride is a catalyst in the hindrance of being able to receive something from Allah Hayyam. And we're going to get into it here to see that he's telling us stuff, showing us stuff so that he can actually keep us from pride. So we have to work on humility in everything to be able to continue building with him. And you didn't have anything else? No. Okay. And in that humility, we have to want him to identify the things. We want to be seen. We want our true selves to be uncovered so that he'll let us know what's going on. In uh, Psalms 139 and 23, please. Search me, O Elohim, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. You see the heart we have to have. It's not deceit trying to get over and stay where we are, but rather like, hey, whatever it may be, find it, search me, check me, examine me. And if you find something, lead me in the way everlasting. Send your light forth to give me the reproof, that fine oil that shall not break my head. And help turn me aright. That, that definitely makes the difference of whether you're living for Allah or you're living for yourself or to be seen inside of men. Because if your heart is set upon Allah bringing forth what's true, then you will be looking for growth. You'll be looking for the things that's going to glorify Allah the things that's going to help you serve Him. But if you're not, then you're going to have a, a um, have pushback because you're only going to be looking for the things that makes you look right in the sight of others. And that's exactly what this lesson is about to go into going in, going in here mm -hmm. is the true heart and the mind of what it takes to actually be a servant of Allah because even as, as David said, he said, and see if there be any wicked way in me. So he's like, check me, examine me, and tell me if there's something going on that's not good, something that I'm doing that's not leading me unto righteousness or leading me to serve you wholeheartedly. And lead me in the way everlasting. So it's like, okay, well, lead me. You tell me what I need to do and where I need to go. And that's the mindset that we have to have. Is Allah, you guide me and you lead me and you show me what it is that I need to do and what it is that I need to allow to enter into my heart so that my heart can actually be right unto you. And that is the that is the mindset that we need to have to be able to to endure this walk. And to make it to the end of this journey. And while we wait for him to point it out, we have the Lord as faithful as an oracle. Yes, it is. So we can always be guided even while we're waiting for an answer. <laughs> it's okay. While I wait, what do I do according to the law? Waiting to work righteousness until he be pleased to reveal what I need to know. So when he points out things, it's actually to help not discourage us. It's our own exaggerated sense of self that conflicts with the correction. But if we approach all things without a preconceived notion of ourselves and only to gain going in the right direction, we would be able to walk with less resistance and be led by the spirit of truth. 
It's like a father knowing when you're ready or it's the right time to hear it. He says, my son or my daughter, watch out for this too now so you can keep growing. And he does speak. He does care. In Job 33, verse 14 to 18, please. But Allah speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. In the dream, in the vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, and slumberings upon the bed. Then he openeth the ears of men, and sealeth their instruction that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. So he's speaking with good intent. And when he speaks in dreams, man perceiveth not. Interpretations belong unto Allah. This is why when we have a dream, like we discussed for the last lesson, mm -hmm. If you have a dream, tell the dream. Go to your faithful counselor who you know keeps the commandments. Make sure to pray to Allah to reveal the dream because it belongs to him. And leave it right there until Allah be pleased to give answer. Right? That's going to help keep us back from the pit. He wants us to do that because he makes sure we're doing everything in humility. Not to walk according to our own understanding or what we feel or the imaginations of our hearts of what we think the dream may mean, because that can actually cause us to stumble. Mm -hmm. Right? We can hold back our admonitions for ourselves if the dream is for us, or the person who the dream could actually be for. Right? So it's a selfless act to actually just tell the dream and put it in Allah Hayim's hands. So... I know you like something. <laughs> if you have something there. This is, it's funny. Um, this is where it, it really boils down to. Passage says a selfless act. And serving Allah is selfless. Like, if you're selfish, you're going to struggle in this walk. Because the whole walk it's about being selfless, about giving yourself to Allah and not keeping anything for yourself. Like your own desires is selfish. You have to let it go. That's the only way you can serve Allah Thinking upon the needs of others is selfless. Like everything that Allah asks us to do is selfless works where we're not looking for our own gain. And any time that a man is looking for their own gain, they end up going the opposite direction. So really getting to the bottom of it, you have to get to the point where your heart is selfless, where you're not looking for your own gain. You're not looking to fulfill your own desires or your own your own needs or wants. Instead, you're trusting in Allah for him to provide all things for you. Just like he gives unto the birds, Allah give it unto the, the righteous and the wicked. He provides for everybody. So to be thinking upon the things that you desire when Allah is already giving you what you need, it makes you selfish. And it makes it hard for you to serve Allah in truth because he's asking you to, to give everything away, even the rich man. He asked the rich man to give away all his riches, and the rich man couldn't do it. Everything that Allah asks us to do is selfless acts, and you, you, you have to have a heart of selflessness, of seeking to help others more than yourself. That, yeah, I want you to cuss it. Thanks, Allah So, Allah himself being selfless, He's speaking to us in dreams to keep back our soul from the pit and us from dying by the sword. And his instructions are to hide us from the spirit of pride by walking in humility to be able to receive his instructions. So it forces us to grow in humility so that we would bow down our ear to be able to learn and not persist in 
doing the same thing over and over, producing the same outcome. That understanding helps us keep his commandments, seeing that it's not us that brings things to remembrance in times of need so that we don't die in this life, nor in the judgment in the pit after this life. All right. If you read Job 33 and 27, please. He looketh upon men, and if any say, I have sinned, and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not, he would deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. He looks for the person that will confess their sin and acknowledge their wrongs in humility. That person truly has to see they aren't benefiting from it so it's not a person who knows they're wrong but still feels there is something to gain from their desires when he finds one he's going to give that repentant man understanding of his sins so he can understand and come out of them and be delivered from his ways that were leading him to the pit continue verse 29 please lo all these things work of Elohim oftentimes with man to bring back his soul from the pit to be enlightened with the light of the living. He doesn't want us to be in pride, so he instructs to save us, yet we have to actually repent and humble ourselves to see there isn't profit in our desires to receive the light of his words that he is sending unto us to shed light and scatter the darkness operating in us. So taking heed to what our Father says is needful for our chastening and cleansing. Psalms 119 and 9, please. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. We have to understand we're being given a chance at life. We're being given an opportunity that many of all time would have died to receive this process we get to embark on. You even remember from the pride lesson, the dead, they wished they had opportunity to come out of what they did, knowing that when in the pit or in the torments, they realized their pride that they operated in life didn't actually benefit them. So we really have a chance at this. So we can appreciate what it is that's actually happening. We have a great opportunity. And that's what we have to hold on to every day. Not holding on to our desires of the world and the flesh. It's bringing us out of our shortcomings to take heed and guard what he says to do. So it's something to be happy about. If you read Psalms 19 and 8, please. The statutes of Ahia are right, rejoice in the heart. The commandment of Ahia is pure, enlightening the eyes. You see, it's actually a rejoicing because we want the correction. That's the key point. You actually have to want the correction. And it makes us happy because it's opened our eyes to see clearly, to take heed unto what's commanded to convert us by making us wise as serpents and harmless as doves to do right in humility and cleanse our ways by good works. So we shouldn't get down as we learn as if it's something bad happening to us. It's cleansing our way so that there's no evil in us. Don't be discouraged on how much needs to be rooted out of us. It's like cleaning a new property. Yes, it may be junky at first, but as you start working and cleaning it, you start seeing the potential all the way until it's finished. And now you get the experience, the fruits of your labors when you see the new house that is made. So though it may have been grievous, yet once you get started working, you will start seeing the good moments of growth and eventually be let out of it because we know it's in faithfulness that he can change us, that he is taking us through this and helping us. Right? Psalms 119.75 I know, O Ahia, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. So you see that it, the two things, yes, we know his judgments are right. 
that's that's something we need but also we have to know mm -hmm. that he's doing it in faithfulness it's actual love and belief that we can actually come out of it okay it shows our trust to be happy as we are learning because it shows we know he is revealing things faithfully knowing we can change because he will do it in us if we be willing and obedient Psalms 19 and 11, please. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them, there is great reward. So we look at the law as boundaries to warn us from the evil, like protocols for safety, not a restraint from desire or a burden too heavy to bear because we have desires. But we're happy to work on keeping them, knowing the rewards we will get for doing it. And when faults we don't know about or see come up, we take it with cheer humbly because we couldn't actually know it if he wasn't willing to reveal it out of love for us. So seeing that he actually had mercy upon us to bless us and show us our iniquity so we can turn from it is actually something to be happy about. Right? Sirach 2 and 4, please. Whatsoever is brought upon thee, take cheerfully. And be patient when thou art changed to a low estate. So he'll bring something. Hey, this is a new work we need to start practicing. Take it cheerfully. And be patient when brought to a low estate. Maybe he saw, okay, pride is getting you here. He'll reveal something to bring us back to the humility. Take that cheerfully as well and be patient, okay? Thank you for setting me back on track. Let me patiently work. And we're going to get to patience later on down in this toward the end to understand patience. All right. I got a perspective on this one. Um, let's say you're in the season, right? And Allah brought something new for you to learn or something new for you to impl implement. Okay. And by the time you get to the end of that season, you're stronger in what it is that you were implementing. Right. But the next season comes. And the next season, it's a new implementation that you're not strong in. So you have to now, at one moment, you felt like, hey, I got this. I'm doing better. I, I got I'm getting my footing. Um I got this. I'm 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 feeling confident in, in doing this. And then the next season you you lose that confidence because you have to now baby step the next thing that you're learning in the new season. So be patient when you're changed to a lower state. You may have to take those baby steps to get your footing to be able to be able to to do the next thing. I can use like a parallel. Let's say if I'm I'm practicing guitar, okay? And let's say there's things that I'm practicing that I'm really good at. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting good at that. But then when I start doing something new or start practicing something new, I'm going real slow. I'm baby stepping. Bing, 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 bing. I'm baby stepping because I can't just run into it and just start shredding or just start playing very well. I have to take my time and learn the fingerings, learn what I'm doing in the concept so that I can actually excel in it. And it's the same thing with this walk. You have to take on every day joyfully and cheerfully, whether you're doing well in something that you've been doing or you're learning something new that you're not experienced in. You have to take it all with joy because it's all a part of the process. It's all a part of the journey. And knowing that every part of that journey and everything that you're growing in or learning is going to help you be serve Allah to the best of your ability. So you have to be mindful of that. You have to be mindful of the end goal. And we're going to talk about that in here 
about how Elohim keep that on our hearts, keep that on our minds so that we're not discouraged going forward so that we can understand what we're going forward to. Man. If you'll continue Psalms 19 and 12, please. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. It's a time of rejoicing when he does reveal it, because that means he saw our heart was in a place to receive it. Or it was the due season to show us, so we are actually growing. And it's also a happy event because he is being gracious to help us understand what's going on with us so we don't stay in our iniquities willfully or in oblivion. Verse 13, please. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright. And I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Doing things presumptuously or woefully in pride is the great transgression. But if we humble ourselves when faults are revealed, being thankful and willing to work on changing, he will accept our prayers and not despise us. Can you read Psalms 51 and 17, please? The sacrifices of Elohim are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O Elohim, thou would not despise. When a false revealed, thank Elohim for not allowing an evil to enter into your heart or stay in your heart. Take it as good and praying to him to take away the desire of the sin for it not to be in your heart after acknowledging the wrong we have done. Continue to Psalms 51 and 2, please. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out mine iniquities. Notice when we acknowledge what we do, we actually justify Ahaya when he speaks. That's why when you look at the word for confess, it also has to do with thanksgiving or praise, because to confess a transgression is actually praising him as well, because you're exalting him, that his law is right and holy and good. So pray for him to cleanse our heart, and give us a right spirit to go forward and do the work to change. If you read verse 10, please. Create in me a clean heart, O Elohim, and renew a right spirit within me. So you see, we have to work and also be praying because it's him that actually does it, not we ourselves. If we happen to get upset or sad or down, then we need to take a moment and reason to set our minds right, casting away sorrow from us and praying for joy and remembrance of the joy of the process. If we truly understand that if we get down when someone helps us, it's pride in our hearts that didn't want to be helped, not understanding we have no understanding in ourselves, but are constantly being led either by one side or the other. If we have that mind in us, then we'll eschew evil when it comes to get us to agree with it. So that's to help us understand when we go through this process, no, though he afflicted us with correction, it's for our benefit in the end. Right? First Peter chapter 3, verse 11, please. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. The definition of a shoe in G1578 is to deviate. That is absolutely to shun, literally or figuratively, or relative to decline from piety, or relatively. So that's like the other side of it. Mm -hmm. Avoid a shoe, go out of the way, right? to turn oneself away, to turn away from, keep aloof from one's society, right? So we have to have the mindset 
to keep aloof from Satan's society of spirits that want us to agree with them. If we feel we are lacking joy as we are being corrected, take the time to reason on things to rejoice for and pray for joy and gladness that Allah Hayyam may send his spirits to help us. That's an interesting thing. It's true. It said, keep aloof from one society. And society is, is the people that you're surrounding yourself with. So if you're surrounding yourself with Satan and his evil spirits, then that's what you're going to start operating like because that's the company you're keeping. But if you surround yourself with Allah Hayyam and his spirits, then that's what you're going to start picking up from because that's the people, the influences that's around you. So you get to see we're choosing what society of, of spirits that we want to be around. And that makes the difference of what's going to impact us and what's going to influence us. Can you read Psalms 51 and 8, please? Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Seeing that we're guarding our heart and soul from evil, and our mind is the battleground that decides what goes past and what is withstood to keep from agreeing with the society of the devil, we would be joyful and glad catching those evil things so that they may not enter. Seeing that we can come out of it easily if we don't agree with it, ourselves pray to him to help you put on patience to wait on the good and righteous thoughts by his angel to rejoice you and encourage yourself too as it's a team effort where we have our part to play as well and that's very important because you should be joyful and glad when you catch the evil from entering into your heart. When you have a thought and you don't agree with that thought, you're like, hold on, that's not the right thought. Okay. Allow him to keep that from entering into my heart and cast it away. Right? Because it's stewing evil, right? It's stew meant to the to shun, to deviate. So you're going away from it, right? Or to decline. So we're supposed to stew evil. So when that evil thought comes, we're supposed to decline it or shun it. That means silence it so it doesn't enter into our heart. Like, I don't want that. I'm not in agreement with that. And Allah Hayyam, rebuke that and keep that far away from me and don't let it enter into my heart. That's us protecting our heart because we don't want that to enter in. And if it comes and if it comes back, that thought comes back, that means that we didn't implement what we were supposed to implement. Where, no matter what the case is, let's say you had a, a thought, an evil thought about your brother, then you didn't, you didn't replace the thought with having thoughts of them having perfect prosperity. Or if you have a thought that uh, about harming somebody, you didn't bring forth the thoughts of love to then combat it and replace it. So it's us, we have to choose the society of what spirits we wanna be entangled with. So if we're not bringing forth or allowing the good spirits to have place to surround us or to bring thoughts onto us, that's going to eschew the evil, then we're still giving place to the society of the, of the devil. We have to speak these things. It's our job. Allah gave us a mouth for praise. Our body's not made for war. Our mouth is made to praise. So this is what we're supposed to be using it for. When we when we have situations where evil, evil imaginations are surrounding us or they're coming into our thoughts, 
we have to eschew those and we have to bring forth the right thoughts. It's just like hanging around the wrong group of people. And the only way to get away from hanging around the wrong group of people is to find a good group and to start transitioning. You actually have to start moving away from the bad people and start moving to the good people and hanging with them. It's the same thing. And with that, take it and enjoy it. Notice we have to, when we catch the evil thoughts, we have to be joyful to catch the thought because it's Elohim that strengthened us to catch it. So be mindful of the sorrow of like, ah, oh, here's that thought again, or it came back. Like some, some things are stronger. Some things is just being honest. We have more pleasure. And so it's going to take a lot of work to overcome, but don't get discouraged. Okay. Yeah. And you gotta be honest. If it's something you have pleasure in, like Elohim, that got that that thought came, or or I got got because I had pleasure in it. You have to be honest, so that you can actually turn from it. Because if it's like, okay, I had pleasure in that, okay, now I need to root out the pleasure that I have, and I the only way I can take the time and be diligent to root out the pleasure that I have in it is if I'm honest with myself and Elohim to say that I have a problem. If I don't if I don't say I have a problem, I'm going to continue sweeping it under the rug and I'm never going to deal with it. And it's going to persist. It's going to keep occurring because I'm not dealing with it and I'm not being honest. If I have a problem with lying, I need to say, Allah, I am I have a problem with lying. And it's in my it's in my heart. That's why I keep doing it. I get pleasure in lying. And what I benefit from it. And then you have to actually start making the steps. Like, okay, I see that that's wrong. That's not the way that you want me to operate. And I have to find in myself for it not to be the way that I want to operate. And that's not the person that I want to be. And that's not the person I know you want me to be. So now, okay, what does your law say? This is what your law says. That's your stance. That's Elohim's standard of if I'm going to serve Elohim, that's the standard that Elohim has placed upon me if I'm going to come and partake in his labors. And I have to correct my heart with that. Elohim, please turn my heart to, to do things according to thy will and do things according to what's right in thy sight because my sight is, isn't correct. You have to be honest. Like, you have to be extremely honest. And when that when it, you get attacked by it or it comes upon you, you have to be honest. Say, hey, that was the lust of the eyes. Allah him turn my heart from that. Like you have to be honest. That's the only way. And you can't get grieved about it. Because it's Allah him that's revealing it to you so that you can actually see and turn from your iniquity. He's bringing it forth and bringing it to the light so that you can understand. That is something that you need to work on and something that you need to change. Don't get grieved by having to change something. Because if if it was if it, if that was the case, why would Allah reveal it to you if it's something bad? If you turning from your sin is bad then that defeats the whole purpose of why we're here. So it's actually coming out of that society of the devil and the mentality of that society because those societies, the people that you hang around, they have mentalities. And that's what makes people different. We're all the same flesh. It's the mentality that makes us different. So that means that the mentality that you learn from the society of people or spirits that you hung around is the problem. And you have to come out of that mentality so that you can actually put on a righteous mentality that's actually going to allow you to serve Allah Hayyam. And that's going to be willing and obedient and joyful when it comes to you having to make a correction or a change. 
man. That all ties in the 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 gallon, the souls with vain words and the necessi necessity to be honest because mm -hmm. our words is one thing to speak true words because Allah is true and he's completely true. Mm -hmm. There's no falsehood with him. When we tell what's going on to tell it in its wholeness, we're being genuine with him. Like this is what's really going on. I'm telling you everything. And as you know, in the evil society, they don't like snitches. Right. So if you tell Allah the whole truth, just as in a bad crowd, eventually those people are not going to want to be around you because you're correcting everything. You're calling things out. This is a part of separating yourself from the entities. Like tell the truth, tell Allah And as everything Zach was said, it will help separate us from them. Okay. That is interesting because when you actually snitch, the one that did the wrong gets taken away. And then the other ones that were in agreement with the one that did wrong, they become your enemy. So you're actually opposing, you're actually eschewing evil because you're declining, you're shunning, you're, what was the other word? Deviate? Did it say to deviate? I can't recall offhand. There it is. Yeah, to deviate. Right. So you're actually doing what Allah asked you to do. You're actually eschewing evil. So it's, I'm telling right. <laughs> it's a blessing he really opens the eyes to see what's happening and to be able to speak the truth about it because if you hide the evil then the evil stays so, so you can see this was good to see the part we play too even in a fall, we have a part to play to make correction. Okay. Can you read Sirach 30 and 23, please? Love thy own soul and comfort thy heart. Remove sorrow far from thee. For sorrow hath killed many, and there is no profit therein. It's interesting. Love and truth, they're related. They come from the same society. They're his daughters. So love our own selves to be honest and tell the whole truth to Allah Hayim. and then comfort our heart in joy taking it cheerfully not to allow sorrow which comes from the other society to take us away all right because as you tell on one person now they're aware of you they're going to try to be more subtle now because they see you're willing to tell on them hence the attacks will get more subtle, but that's what we have Allah Hayyam for to point things out. Right? So the first step is loving yourself, not looking at it as if you're this terrible person, which is what the society of the devil will want you to, to see it as. All right. right? They're gonna they're gonna um, shame you and uh, blame shift. You know that's how they work. It's not just this physical thing that people do where they're gaslighting and blame shifting and, and, and these things. This is how these evil spirits operate and they're going to do it to you. You know, the only difference is they're going to do it to you in your mind and not outright physically. And if you find you may have a counselor that when you do confess your faults because you're trying to get help, they beat you down that's letting you know that's not the counselor you should be going to because they also have some growing to do themselves okay so the first step is loving yourself not looking at it as if you're this terrible person but simply to see that you've been misled and now have a need to be led and taught again so I'm a, I'm a child, I'm a babe, I'm relearning, All right? Yes, I learned the things that weren't right and it didn't profit me. So I'm starting over. With that understanding, you'll see the things you agree with are the problem and not your vessel. Like Zach was said, we were actually, we did a whole lesson the mind, the body and the senses. We're actually made for our lives uses. So our body in itself isn't the problem. 
It's the mind and the choices. Well, we're allowed to enter into our hearts. Yeah. For we're either a vessel unto honor or dishonor, depending on what we agree with. So it brings a comfort to heart in Allah Hayyam to remove the sorrow, along with praying for him to give us joy and rejoicing when tempted to agree with evil and shunning it. Can you read Psalms 51 and 12, please? Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. This is the verse I was talking about earlier. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm just... I'm saying this is the one I referenced when I said we're going to get to it later. Okay. We should be refreshed by remembering what we're doing all this for. It's for our own salvation, and there should be no amount of work that's too much for us to gain it. But there are times where we need that reminder, as it may slip our minds depending on what we may be dealing with or going through. We pray Allah Hayyam restore that joy of his salvation in our times of need, that it may rejoice us and we may be freed from sorrow. That's a weighty spirit and hinders us from being free and light in that yoke of Christ. And also pray if you notice in the moments when you're in a trial, the law isn't coming to mind, pray Allah Hayyam bring it to mind. Pray Allah Hayyam strengthen us to be patient to wait for it. As Zach will talk about whatever we see, we have to be honest and talk with him about it to help us grow. And don't stress ourselves out when, no matter what we see, we have need of when we reason on, okay, how did I get there? What transpired? All right. Surat 30 and 21, please. Give not over thy mind to heaviness and afflict not thyself in thy own counsel. So don't sit there getting weighed down about the faults or new revelations of shortcomings, but cast the sorrow away so you can keep working or take things in with a good spirit and look for the answers to implement what you need to, to withstand with understanding so you can actually do it. All right. When you sit and reason, that shouldn't be an emotional time when you're going through it. It's you have to calm yourself down and look. We have to be objective to actually see, okay, how did I get there? This did happen. I, I missed it right there. That's why I fell. I got to pray about that to see what I need to do. Or I, I'm aware of what I should have done. I got to pray to be humble to actually do it or to slow down. Or maybe I don't know how I got there because I keep doing it. I need to get in touch with my counselor and talk about this because it's still happening. If you stay in that sorrow or start doubting, you're letting deceit into your heart, which would lead you to judge yourself and afflict yourself based on what you perceive to be a proper judgment for your fault. Instead of repenting in simplicity, getting back in the fight, working on not being in agreement with the thought that made you fall, and allowing Allah to judge or bring punishment if they will for the mishaps. Can you read Proverbs 12 and 20, please? Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil, but to the counselors of peace is joy. You may need to reach out to your counselor with the intent to get back in the right spirit and get counsel to get to a peace of mind and have joy so you can continue walking. If need be, do so and come with the intent to come out of it, not looking for justification or reason to stay in it. You have to take the small victories of change and rejoice in them and encourage yourself with words of righteousness and optimism that you can change your desires because it's Allah Hayyam doing it. And eventually, the new image of self will be formed piece by piece with each small victory. Right? Hermas Vision 1, chapter 3, verse 2, please. But the great mercy of the Lord had pity on thee and thy family, and will strengthen thee and establish thee in his glory. Only be not thou careless, but take courage, and strengthen thy family, 
For at the smith hammering his work conquers the task which he wills, so also do a righteous discourse repeated daily conquer all evil. Cease not therefore to reprove thy children, for I know that if they shall repent with all their heart, they shall be written in the books of life with the saints. It's interesting they use a smith hammering because the work he's working on, it doesn't look like what he wants it to look while he's doing it. But he's hammering and chiseling because he knows where he's going and he's seeing it form. He's paying attention to the product it's going to become. He's not watching the refuse or the parts that fall off in his feelings, but he's just looking and getting encouraged the more and more he sees the work happening. He sees little pieces coming off until that product is formed. That's interesting, Casa. You know, when it comes to a, 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 a blacksmith, they have to buy a big piece of something just to form a small piece out of it. Mm -hmm. If if you could imagine that every time they bought a big piece of something and they had to chisel and, and break away at it and they were crying because they were thinking about what they were losing, then they will have a hard time being a blacksmith. Yeah. And that's the same for us. If we're crying about the things that we're having to lose in order to become the person that we that we're supposed to be in Alahayim, then that doesn't form us to be good servants. It shows we don't believe in the reward to come at the end. Because the Smith, he knows what he's gonna gain when that product's finished. Right. And that puts us back over here. That's right. That takes us back to Psalm fifty one and twelve. Restoring to me the joy of thy salvation. Like we're supposed to, we're supposed to remember the end goal. And that joy, by keeping our eyes set on the salvation of Elohim and where we're going, what we're aiming to, is supposed to keep us. But many a times we forget that. We get so caught up in the moment. We get so caught up in our desire or whatever it is that we don't want to lose. And we forget the end goal. Hopefully that helps us. So putting that verse in Hermas in context for ourselves. Believe Allah will strengthen us. And not only so, but he will establish us in faith. As we continue getting filled with the milk of the, his word listening to his angel and in that belief we have to be diligent not careless but taking courage to strengthen ourselves with the words of righteousness to hold ourselves accountable reproving ourselves in optimism and hope repeating them to ourselves to conquer all the evil that starts in our minds not being careless to make provisions for the evil thoughts but strengthening ourselves with optimism and positivity in truth being honest in our heart, not ceasing to reprove our own selves, to stay focused and do the works so we can actually be in true repentance, chipping away at our shortcomings and every little stone that falls away as we work. Let's rejoice in those small victories when we see Allah doing good in us and cherish the moment for hope to keep working when we get the taste of the milk of his word to see that it's good and it works for courage to keep working and building step by step. All right. Take it all in joy. Even if you notice, like we talked about before, you notice you may come out of it quicker or he may strengthen you to catch it or he may strengthen you to just acknowledge what you did. Like rejoice in it. Like, thank you. You know, this is what the faithful do as a just man will fall and get back up. Proverbs 24 and 16, please. For a just man falleth seven times and rises up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. So let's work on truly being just. And now we see the wicked and what they would end up doing. Let's understand how a wicked spirit can get us into mischief when we fall 
instead of getting back up. Right. We're going now to talk about man pleasing, the indulgence of man pleasing. It's important to understand for our growth. As the spirit of man pleasing keeps us from growth, as we're going to get edification on today. Can you read Psalms of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 8, and then verse 5, please? Let Elohim reveal the deeds of the man pleasers. Man pleasers operate differently in secret or in the secret of their hearts and minds than they show themselves to be. That's why Allah has to do it. Okay. Continue verse 5. By night and in secret he sinneth as though unseen. So, in their heart, or when no one is able to see them, like in the night, or when they're around people they're comfortable with that know that side of them already, they are a different person as they indulge in deceit to act upright or good rather than truly working to genuinely be upright and good. Luke chapter 11, verse 39, please. And the Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. So their efforts were to work on the things that people would see outwardly, while neglecting to deal with what's going on within them, indulging in their desires within themselves. Matthew twenty three twenty seven. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. So notice he's speaking to the five scribes and Pharisees, but this can apply to present day because he's really speaking about hypocrites. Mm -hmm. Okay. Outwardly beautiful, but within they are in the uncleanness of idols, notwithstanding the evils from entering into their hearts, but agreeing with the evil and deceiving others by their silence. All right. This is where they may not say a word, but within there's a whole conversation going on the next verse please even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity inwardly hypocrisy and iniquity tell the truth about us even though we may have done the work to appear well on the outside understanding the inner man of a man pleaser when we have something going on in our hearts, we don't stop everything to correct it. But in haste, we put on an outward show to at least appear righteous to the man in front of us. But within, we are in hypocrisy and iniquity before Allah Hayyam, who truly sees us as we aren't genuinely the person we are trying to portray. This is feigning ourselves. This is a work of deceit. It's a part of the spirit of lying. Okay. This is foolish on our part because we aren't acknowledging the creator in all this like he can't see us as we are just focused on pleasing men. Uh, Luke 11 and 40, please. Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? If we would open our spiritual eyes to see Allah sees us, we can just be sincere and clean the inside of us by being completely honest, as Zachwan talked about earlier. Matthew 23 and 26, please. Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Take notice of this here. Mm -hmm. The outside of a cup can't clean the inside of it. He was giving us the true perspective that Allah Hayyam sees versus how we see as men blinded by indulgence and pleasure to think the outside can actually be clean, though we don't clean what's within first. So understanding Allah Hayyam's outlook, the inside of our cup, which is our heart and mind, is what we need to be focused on cleaning by stopping when an evil desire arises and coming out of it, 
not allowing it to enter it into our heart before moving forward in anything. And if we focus on doing this by cleansing the inside and allowing no evil into it, no evil will proceed out of it either, and it will actually clean the outside of us before Allah I am. Okay. Matthew 12 and 35, please. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. So, if we focus on the heart, the good is actually going to come out truly. Because this is in regards to Allah I am. If my heart is evil, I'm going to bring forth the evil treasure even when I'm feigning myself or acting good because I'm acting. It's hypocrisy before Allah I am, though the person in front of me may not know it. I'm deceiving them, though the person in front of me may not know it. Allah I am sees it. All right? But if I'm telling the truth and genuinely, like, hey, I need a moment. Or, you know, I'm, I need to settle down. Whatever we need to do, hey, I don't know the answer. I'm going to have to pray about it. Whatever we have to do to be genuine, it's going to help us actually be a good person and bring forth good fruit. Because even if you don't know if you're admitting you need a moment, you're being honest. That's true. That's a good spirit. Regardless of what a person may think of you. And it helps bring us to humility because we're doing it for Allah I am, not for the sake of what the person may think of us. That's right. Because if you if you rush through things or you're hasty, right? And you allow an evil spirit to enter into your heart. Let's say somebody does something that you are displeased with or something that you're struggling not to take personally. And you rush through it. What's it going to bring forth? It's going to bring forth you transgressing the law because the evil spirit entered into your heart, which is going to bring forth a work of evil. So by you actually being hasty, you're actually helping the evil spirit. And that shows that you're falling into man pleasing because you're not willing to do what's necessary to guard yourself for the sake of Allah. I am. So you definitely have to be mindful of wh who you're doing things for. If I need a moment, say, Hey, um, if somebody says something and I need a moment to, to gather myself, say, Hey, uh, if you don't mind, give me a moment so I can gather myself and I'll come back. Like you didn't transgress a law. You didn't allow evil spirit to enter into your heart. You're actually guarding yourself. And if that person thinks less of you, it doesn't really matter. Because if you're living for Allah, I am, you should be looking for, okay, did I transgress the commandments? And did I not operate in the fruits of the spirit? Was that a work of the flesh or was that the fruits of the spirit? By asking somebody to give you a moment, you didn't transgress any commandment or any fruit of the Spirit. But if you would have went forward in hastiness, trying to, to brush over the fact that you were bothered, you're going to bring forth the work to the flesh, which actually would cause you to transgress Allah commandments. So you actually have to look and judge what's right and what's going to help you actually do what's right in the sight of Allah I am always. So what we bring forth shows where our heart is. So we need to take heed to ourselves to cleanse within. Can you read Sirach 1 and 29, please? Be not an hypocrite in the sight of men and take good heed what thou speakest. It's interesting. Be not a hypocrite in the sight of men. Don't be an actor. Be whatever's in the heart. If it's not good, stop and take the moment to make it good and then operate so that we're not a hypocrite. Because so long as our heart is feeling one way, but outwardly we're, outwardly, outwardly we're operating differently, 
we're in the hypocrisy. You're not being genuine. Right. It has to be whole, whatever we do, whatever we say. So like Zach was saying, taking that moment to make sure we get to the right place so that we can actually be whole, be complete in whatever we're doing, that's essential because that's wisdom. That's how to avoid being a hypocrite in the sight of men. Right? And if something's causing you to go away from that love of Allah Hayyam towards your brother or sister, that's a good moment to know that you need to gather yourself and get yourself together to get back to that love so that you can operate. Because the last thing you want to do is take on bitterness or strife or anger based off of what you're receiving. But then you're taking on the poison. And then you're going to sin doubly. <laughs> yeah. That's why God said love each one another in word and deed and inclination of soul. Mm -hmm. Got to get to where it's complete. It's really what we feel and what we want. That's where the reasoning comes into play to sit back and take the breaths that we need, pray, and sit there until we actually get to the place where we're not in agreement with it or desiring it. More at peace. Yeah. So if we don't take heed to make sure we're not a hypocrite in the sight of men, so we're not acting one way when we're not truly that person, and if we don't take heed to what we're saying to make sure it's genuine and it's in the fruits and it's within the boundaries of the law, if we don't do it, Allah will reveal our iniquity openly. Since we chose not to do the work in sincerity, being real about who and where we are, but in pride, we try to uphold an image that's not truly us. Can you read Sirach 1 and 30, please? Exalt not thyself, lest thou fall, and bring dishonor upon thy soul. And so Elohim discover thy secrets, and cast thee down in the midst of the congregation, because thou camest not in truth to the fear of the Lord, but thy heart is full of deceit. You notice that if we're not being genuine in the sight of men, and taking heed to speak the truth according to the law and the fruits of the Spirit, we're actually exalting ourselves. It's a work of pride. Man pleasing is a work of pride. Mm -hmm. Trust and believe Allah will bring those faults out if we don't humble ourselves, not desiring glory, and be genuinely honest, not willing to put on a show or unrealistic persona of ourselves to anyone. Can you read Psalms of Solomon chapter 4 verse 8 and verse 10 please? Psalms for Solomon chapter 4 verse 8. Let Allah reveal the deeds the men pleasers. When Peter failed to respect the persons, he was admonished before everyone there. So there is no respect of persons with Allah to reveal our deeds, to help us see our shortcomings, or put us to shame before others, if that's what it takes to humble us like it helped Peter get to perfection and grow. Verse 10, please. Even the men pleaser who uttereth law guilefully. A man pleaser utters the law guilefully as he is using it to win you over in seeming good or to overcompensate for his shortcomings, or to get an advantage for himself. But he isn't using it to correct his inner man in truth, being deceitful before everyone, like he is upright or striving for the faith. So Allah will reveal the secret of what we are doing in front of the congregation if we don't be honest and sincere to confess and do the work to change for real. Instead of just making sure we look good to men that can't see what's going on within us. So, if you notice you got some things going on, go talk to your counselor. Confess what's really going on and get the understanding you need. This doesn't mean open your heart to everybody. 
Because the scripture also tells you don't open your heart to a stranger because you don't know what it will bring forth. There are instances where that person, they are already weak. It may cause them not to believe. Or they may use the opportunity to lift themselves up, which is their own struggle. But I am, he really looks out for the best interests of all. And that's why he instructs us to go to your one counselor that you know keeps the commands and is going to sorrow with you if you miscarry. Right? You good in this section? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we're going to get into the signs of a man pleaser. We kind of just touched on the heart of a man, please. <laughs> now we're kind of getting into the signs of one. Okay. There are signs to know the man pleaser. Though he may act upright, nonetheless, there are signs to detect the spirit he's really walking in. Or she. Thank you. I was just about to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Psalms of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 1. Wherefore sittest thou, O profane man? in the counsel of the pious, seeing that thy heart is far removed from Ahiah, provoking with transgressions the Elohim of Israel. He will stay in transgression because he isn't actually dealing with what's going on within himself, in his heart. As you see, it said profane man. He's profaned with idols. But he's just appearing righteous to men to please them or get the admiration of or validation from them, saying what he believes to be the right thing to say, but not truly in agreement with it when it comes to himself. Now, why will one stay in their sins, though they are in the counsel of the pious? All right, you miss the people that's working to get it right, but this person is deciding to stay in their own sins. Why so? Can you read Sirach 3 and 27, please? An obstinate heart shall be laden with sorrows, and the wicked man shall heap sin upon sin. It's the stubbornness of his heart, where he truly doesn't want to change in his heart. Though the gospel gives good counsel, because he still has pleasure in what he's doing. So putting on the just outward show helps fulfill both the inward desires and the desire for vainglory to be seen as good or held in honor amongst men. So he will be focused on his outward show to dress it up real nice to cover the inward pleasures he still has. But a man with an obstinate heart will be laden with sorrows, seeing all the things they have to be alert against. Not sorrowful because they have to be alert and pay attention, but sorrowful seeing the work it takes for all of us to come out of it and prevail. So it will seem like too much. Right? It will seem like it's not attainable. That's interesting. Because a hypocrite is an actor. And if they're continuing in hypocrisy, that means that they're operating in deceit. So what really happens is is when they're looking for validation from the people they're around, they're wanting to see it. They're able to deceive you. And they're getting they're getting that evil spirit is getting refreshment by being able to deceive others. Which that's a part of the pleasure. Right. The manipulation is a part of the pleasure. So it's like let me see if you're going to validate me to see if you can see see me for who I am or not. Or to see if I'm good enough. If to see if my deceit is good enough for you not to even be able to catch it. I see. There is a pleasure in that. Then the pride that goes with it. That's where the resentment for the person who actually can see it comes in. Right. Because when someone actually sees it, Fornication resents it because it's fornication at work and all of it too. Mm -hmm. Resent that person because no, I'm good at what I'm doing. Isn't no, what you're seeing isn't true. Right. Accept the image I've given you. Like something's wrong with you because I'm not getting over on you. Right. 
And the spirits want to get away from that person because they're pointing it out. That's right. All right, I'm going to stop hanging out with you. Our conversations are going to become less because I'm not able to get over on you. Our conversations are going to be very, very dry. Yeah, and, and surface, surface level. level. <laughs> right. I <laughs> talk about the weather. I talk to you about <laughs> it. <laughs> or I'm going to just make comments and I'm not going to want you to give an answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Spirits are the spirits. And it's interesting you mentioned how he seeks to get over. Look at what, let's see how the man pleaser does it to win people over. For that pleasure that comes with it. It's like the art of seduction. Psalms of Solomon 4 and 2, please. Extravagant in speech, extravagant and outward seeming beyond all men. There's the show. And, and this is what Zach will just mention is something... Something one may not be aware of, but there is a pleasure mm -hmm. in the deceit and getting that validation. That's why we keep doing it. Right? Yeah, you want the validation. The validation is what you strive for. Because that means that I'm good at what I'm doing. And anybody that, let's say if a person plays basketball, they want the crowd to cheer that shows when they do something well, they want the crowd to cheer because it's like, you're validating that I'm doing good. And for a hypocrite, they want to have this outward show, this persona of being this righteous and good person. But inwardly, they're not that person. So they're wanting you to validate the show that they're putting on. And if you don't validate the show that they're putting on, now you become the enemy. Because you're not you're you're saying that they're not as good as they think they are. It's true. So you say it says extravagant in speech. Like they speak well, they're gonna do they're gonna come off very, very well to others. So that people can think, Oh wow, look how well they speak. Look how look at the words they use. Extravagant and outward seeming beyond all men. They're gonna see they're gonna stand up rightly. They're gonna do all the things that make them seem like they're upright and they're gonna be um self-controlled. Like they're going to be seem very pious. But when they come into a uh when they come into a a temptation or they come into a trial, it shows who they really are. Cause they can't hide it. You can't hide the innate reaction of the mind. You can't hide the heart. So when they come into a situation where they're tried, it reveals who they are. That's why it says Alahayim is going to reveal the, the men pleasers. And he does through bringing forth trial or tribulation unto them. And seeing how they respond to the trial of tribulation because the the way you respond to the trial of tribulation is based off that mentality and also your heart. And it exposes it exposes the person. So Alahim knows you can't get away from it. Because you can't change the way you're gonna respond to things because it's it's hasty. Like, you're going to go to what you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. And they said in outward seeming, so it's not genuine. Right. He was specific in the word and the seeming. And that's why it's scripture, other scripture says, um, if thou would have, wouldest get a friend, be not hasty to credit him. Mm hmm Gotta pay attention and actually learn the person. Try right. have experiences with them. And you have to be understanding the law as well to know what you're seeing, understanding the fruits. You know. And for anybody that's with somebody that's a different person in secret, gotta pray for that person because they're in the struggle. Yeah. Right. They're in the indulgence. Let me correct myself. They're notwithstanding. They're in the indulgence. And another sign to know. So they'll seem good in speech and outwardly. If you'll continue reading, please. It's he that is severe of speech 
in condemning sinners in judgment. So he'll be talkative about being upright, as if he's really upright and working in the faith. But you can tell he's still not working in secret when no one's around or in his heart because he would be judgmental of others and a busybody in their business, censoring their life, looking for faults in them instead of focusing on his own, as that will require him to actually change and let go of his desires. In this you see the double mind of the man-pleaser. The correct mindset to grow is in singleness, not using others' weaknesses as a means to stay in our sins, or not to work on our own sins, or feel justified though we are still in our sins. Let's see a man in the right mind to understand the signs of a man-pleaser as the man-pleaser would do the opposite of what we're about to read. Can you read Testament of Issachar, chapter 3, verse 1 to 4, please? When therefore I grew up, my children, I walked in uprightness of heart. Uprightness of his heart was his focus, not his outward show, okay? And my father blessed me, for he saw that I walked in rectitude before him. Notice his father saw, so in the sight of men, he wasn't a hypocrite. Right? Rectitude means morally correct behavior or thinking. Righteousness. So because he focused on his heart, which means he was also focused on what he was thinking to make sure it's upright, you saw his behavior was morally correct and it was within the law. All right? Because he focused on his heart sincerely, his walk was truly upright in his thoughts and behavior, which is exactly the result that comes from cleansing the inside of the cup. Look and see what he did to help him focus on his own heart. In verse 3, please. I was not a busybody in my doings, nor envious and malicious against my neighbor. I never slandered anyone, nor did I censor the life of any man walking as I did in singleness of eye. He had one perception, singleness of eye. Look at now, Allahim's perception. The single-minded man is focused on Allahim to make sure his heart is right before him and make sure his eyes are seeing right according to his sight, not his personal sight. So he isn't actually caught up in what others have going on or looking for what others have going on, or when he sees what others have going on, he isn't judging them to be sure he isn't doing anything that would distract him from purifying his own heart. The man pleaser, on the other hand, is a double-minded person. Having his desires, he still wants to fulfill, so he uses those tactics aforementioned to stay right where he is. So we see Issachar didn't busy himself, not to have to deal with himself in the mind and heart, nor censoring men's lives to find faults. Let's look at these definitions of these words to understand the things to keep away from, to get out of man-pleasing, or stay, stay away from man-pleasing. Uh, busybody. It's G244. The Thayer's definition is one who takes the supervision of affairs pertaining to others and in no wise to himself, a meddler in other men's affairs. So he becomes a judge of the law, where he's looking at what others have going on and he takes it upon himself to do it. It's not somebody coming asking him for help to help sift through a situation or understand something. He's looking for that because that helps him to exalt himself over them. Then you have envy, a feeling of discontented or resentful longing aroused by someone else's possessions, qualities, or luck. So it requires looking at what somebody else has to get into envy instead of being content and focused on Allah and appreciating what we have in our own hand. All right. Then censor. It means express severe disapproval of someone or something, especially in a formal statement. So in the mind, a person is, they turn their nose up at what somebody has going on. 
and in their speech is going to show in how they talk about him. Okay. And then slander is to make a false or damaging statement about someone. This can happen where a person may think they see something because there's already a struggle of persons in on our own with the beam in our own eye. So we'll think we see something or we'll create something off of maybe what they had done before, slandering them, still critiquing them harshly, thinking they're still doing it or adding on to what they're doing, walking in our own mind, All right? These works are hateful towards others, so we can know what spirits helping do this, distracting us from holding ourselves accountable by looking for issues with others or faults in others or welcoming the thoughts about others' shortcomings or new things that we may not even know is true. Just to avoid seeing ourselves truly to work on ourselves. Did you have anything? Uh, I just wanted to touch on the busying. Okay. Um, it said, um, Testament of Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 3. It says, and I was not a busybody in my doings. So uh, also a part of men pleasing is busying yourself so you don't have to deal with yourself. So be mindful of that when you feel that you always have to do something or you always have to move or you're always having to, to, to be active physically where well, you don't take the time to actually think and ponder upon your actions. You keep moving quickly and moving and moving and moving so that you don't actually have to take the time to actually deal with yourself. And if you see that, then you know that, hey, all right, I am dealing with hypocrisy. I need to slow down and I need to focus and see what's going on with myself. I need to sit down. I need to meditate, you know, stop moving my body so that I can actually deal and focus on the mind and the heart. And we talked about that. Remember what Esau? Yeah, yeah. Bre brethren, brothers and sisters of the children of Edom. Of course, you all know we all got our struggles. We all have our spirits we need to watch out for, you know. But in sincerity of helping people understand themselves, children of Esau, that is something for you to pay attention to, busying yourselves with worldly affairs or just literally busying yourselves, distracting yourselves, having to move, having to do something. Um, not only there'll be a time we talk about you know, focus for helping our brethren of Esau. But in this moment, if you look at Esau, what transpired in his life, he had the same opportunity as Jacob to go study and learn the law and the commandments of his parents, but he didn't want to. It wasn't that Esau didn't have a capacity to learn or understand things because he literally went and learned how to be a hunter of the field. Okay. He just went like, we talked before, the words of Allah, they're spiritual. It was literally a resistance of learning the spiritual things. He didn't have a pleasure in reading. So that's something you all need to combat by reasoning and getting your mind set to have a pleasure in reading the things of Allah, specifically watching the lessons, getting the edification, actually sit there with the notes and reading to follow along. That will help you. And then also not busying yourselves with other things because Esau, he literally stayed busy. He was always out in the field. He had to be moving. He had to be doing something to keep him distracted from dealing with himself. And it's consistent today for his children. You know, just focusing on his children in this moment, not to say it doesn't happen with other people, you know, but the children of Edom, you'll find they... They really, in, they give themselves to their careers or whatever they're into in their life. Like, it's really what matters, whether it be their job, whatever sport team they're into. Like, that's their life. They they really engulfed in it or they have to be doing something out about moving, this and that. It's a, actually a distraction from dealing with the inner man. So you can better understand it to 
dial it back and know what's going on and focus your energy. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm good. All right. Seeing and it's the spirit of hatred at work in a lot of these things because for anyone that is indulging in the spirit of anger, wrath, and hatred, this is pretty much attacking the whole world for all nations because that's what idolatry causes us to do. Hatred is a major catalyst in this because anger uses hatred in the heart of a man to get it to do what it wants it to do. Hatred kindles wrath to help get us into anger. So you see how they work together. But catching, knowing that hatred is at work in the busying ourselves literally or busying ourselves in other people's business or envying others, censoring their lives, welcoming evil speaking or slandering them ourselves. Hatred is in the midst of all of this. And it's to understand it, to know what it is and pray for deliverance from it and call it out, start snitching on it. When you see it happening, tell Allah I am what's going on and be honest. All right. Um, Testament of Gad, chapter 3, verse 3. He dispraiseth the truth. He envieth him that prospereth. He welcometh evil speaking. He loveth arrogance. But hatred blindeth his soul. It's the arrogance that fornication teaches with hatred in the heart that helps to love the arrogance, that helps the man pleaser stay in being a busybody in others' business or busying himself, welcoming the evil speaking the evil spirits brings in the mind and the envy so he can be concerned with everything else but himself so he won't actually grow within, right? You can see the whole goal is just to get us not to look at what's going on in our heart mm -hmm. or to lightly pass over it. Like to say, yeah, that's that's what I'm doing, but we're not stopping to, okay, let me go get the help I need to really get this out. Right? You don't remember it no more. Yeah. If you don't actually stop to deal with it and you just brush over it, you actually, when it comes up again, you feign as if it's never happened before. Like, because you don't have no remembrance of it. So that's where the deceit and folly closes mm. to where there's no memory. So you can see the, there's a lot that these spirits are working and using to get us off into different things. And we're going to talk about them, Lord willing, in the next coming series of stuff. Um, so, you can know it's hatred in the heart of the man pleaser with fornication teaching him in his arrogance to be double minded, not singly focused on his heart to cleanse himself, but caught up with others' business, critiquing their lives, or judging them condescendingly, or busying himself, but not really putting in the work to cleanse his own heart. The law speaks against these things. So to come out of it all, we have to obey in singleness, singly minding our hearts and our minds. Testament of God, chapter 3, verse 1, please. And now, my children, hearken to the words of truth toward righteousness and all the law of the Most High, and go not astray through the spirit of hatred, for it is evil in all the doings of men. Notice it requires our listening skills to come out of it by listening to the words of truth and the fruits, as Gad said, hearken to the words of truth. And also he said, all the law of the Most High. So we also have to hearken to the law that Allah is teaching through his angel so that love can dwell in us, All right? It's possible for us to do this, but we got to do it in singleness, focused on our own heart before Allah not agreeing with evil to enter into our heart, censoring it by the law and the fruits of the Spirit. Testament of God, chapter 5, verse 3, please. Righteousness cast out hatred. Humility destroyeth envy. These two 
tools of these two spirits by being intentional to practice them in singleness just for Allah Hayyam's sake is the only way to come out of it, right? We have to implement this sincerely in our life. Continue, please. For he that is just and humble is the shame to do that which is unjust, being reproved not of another, but of his own heart, because the Lord looketh on his inclination. He speaketh not against the holy man, because the fear of Allah overcometh hatred. For fear and least he should offend the Lord, he will not do wrong to any man, even in thought. These things I learnt at last, after I have repented concerning Joseph. Catch that third thing. The fear of Allah Hayyam overcometh hatred too. So not only working righteousness, but convincing ourselves in our heart to fear Allah Hayyam. Right? We can come to repentance truly. Allah Hayyam will bring us into the light and show us what we need to cleanse within. Can you continue, please? For true repentance after a holy sort destroys ignorance, and driveth away the darkness, and enlighteneth the eyes, and giveth knowledge to the soul, and leadeth the mind to salvation. And those things which it hath not learned from men, it knoweth through repentance. Amen. Okay. It's interesting, because Allah speaks in dreams and visions, yeah. he'll tell you things, yeah. and when you go get the interpretation, you'll know that's something you learn from Allah through repentance. <laughs> so you can know when he's showing things, it's because he's seeing, okay, you get your, it's a new season. It's another opportunity, right? So it's not a bad thing when he shows it. He's trying to help us fulfill our repentance. Right. You can understand that because he would be listening. Oh, sorry. Well, go ahead. No, I just say he's trying to save us. Yeah. <laughs> Real deal. So you can understand that because he would be listening when Allah reveals his secret faults and such and working on changing them, not just what a man points out to him to work on. So he will make sure he is walking and doing up right before Allah in singleness, examining his own heart and not just what man can perceive. Testament of Issachar chapter 5 verse 1, please. Keep therefore, my children, the law of Allah and get singleness. So we got to keep it to be doers to get the singleness we're seeking after. All right. And walk in godlessness, not playing the busybody with the business of your neighbor, but love the Lord and your neighbor. Have compassion on the poor and weak. That's the love at work when we focus on doing the law without guile. As guile is at work when we busy ourselves with someone else's business or we're feigning ourselves to act like we're doing the Lord's business when it's something for us in our heart, whether it be the glory of men or something like that. The definition of guileless is devoid of guile, innocent and without deception. So you see, we keep coming back to the, the trueness of being true entire. What you see is what you actually get. You know, guilelessness is the quality, the quality of being sincere, straightforward, innocence, and artless, right? Artless means there's no deception, there's no guile. We want to be who we actually are, right? It'll help us become who we're trying to become, right? That's the right mind and perspective to have love. Not being in others' business, looking for issues or faults to confirm your grievous forecasts you may have projected upon them, or taking pleasure in the evil thoughts and slander that come to the mind to pollute our hearts from compassion, right. no busying ourselves to distract ourselves from ourselves. For we need compassion. And it's interesting, the compassion. If we would sometimes, hatred is at work in not dealing with ourselves. Fornication is at work in not dealing with ourselves. 
hatred would not hear the commandments concerning love for one's neighbor. Fornication doesn't suffer us to have compassion upon our neighbor. So you can see how these spirits a part of the busyness is because they don't allow us to have compassion on ourselves. Because to sit and actually deal with our hearts, the only way to do it and grow from it is to actually have compassion on ourselves. But hatred and fornication would have us treating ourselves like, oh, I'm this terrible person, I'm the worst. So it's easier to stay busy with whatever else rather than to stop and deal with ourselves in compassion. So... It's for ourselves, too, to grow in compassion and love, all right? And cast that sorrow from us and those evil thoughts. For we need compassion when we do see the fault of another or ourselves, remembering we are no better than anyone else, and we're no better than others who have to go through this same process of seeing the truth of who we are. But we need compassion when we do see the fault of another, remembering we're no better. Not to censor their life, judging or condemning them, or being a busybody, looking for faults in them, as is double-minded, hateful, and a work the man-pleasing spirit uses to keep us from working on our own inner man, using those thoughts and busying ourselves with others to keep from seeing our own inner faults and working on them. This is why a man pleaser goes hard on other folks' shortcomings to overcompensate. And he actually goes hard on himself too. That's a part of why he avoids dealing with himself because he doesn't have love toward himself either. Mm -hmm. right. I, I think I, I believe I understand that this the the true struggle of the hypocrite and a man pleaser a hypocrite and a man pleaser have this person that they want to be and because they have this idolized version of themselves it's hard for them to accept who Allah wants them to be because they're steady trying to reach this certain goal of who they want to be. And even in even in Alahim revealing faults or whatever the case is, they still are trying to obtain that certain goal of who they want to be. So instead of putting off who they want to be and just serving Allah and becoming the person that Allah wants them to be, they're still trying to obtain that standard. They're still like, okay, instead of now, instead of me acting like I'm at this level, now I'm going to put forth the, the work to get to that level. Like that's the next step. But it still puts you in the same place because if Allah is trying to get you to do something different, now you're resisting. Because it's not the direction that you thought you should go. So you still end up, you end up going from one pit to another. Because you never actually let off of your initial desire, which is to be the person that you felt that you should be. person in perspective because the person I formed I wanted to be was from the idolatry I was in so I essentially created my own image right and that's the image that you're trying to obtain constantly yeah and you believe that that image is the image that Allah wants you to be but who said that it is the pride of thinking I knew what righteousness was so I'm going for it like, no, I still know it is right. You did point out something, but that means I just need to do this because I still know it. Instead of I did that, which was wrong and it didn't profit me. I don't know what I'm doing and what I was going for isn't the standard. I need to be a child and relearn everything. Let me just do what Allah says. And the person that I become is the person I become based off of what 
I'm doing this right in the sight of Allah. I am. See the pride of the control of one to know what the end is. Mm -hmm. Like I need to know what I'm doing. Like I have to understand it instead of mm -hmm. just do your process and I'll be who I become when it's over. Just be a doer of the law. Just be a doer of the law. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. That's the simplicity of it. If I'm just being a doer of the law, then I'm not stressing myself. I'm not I'm not beating myself down or sorrowful because I'm not at the level that I believe that I'm supposed to be at based off of my own persona. Like if I'm focused on just doing the law, I'm focused on just doing the law. It doesn't matter how others perceive me because I'm focused on doing the law. makes every moment for Allah Hayyam. Issachar right. is coming to understand him. He said he waited for the will of Allah Hayyam. That's just the that's just the desire. That's just the focus. Right. He didn't he doesn't go beyond a moment. And even Yache said today is sufficient for the, the evil thereof. Right. Sit right here and work in this moment to serve Allah Hayyam. Right. Like if I'm focused on the moment and I'm not focused on this person that I want to be I'm going to focus on the moment of keeping the commandments. I'm going to focus on the moment of bearing the fruits of the Spirit in that situation. In each situation I run into, I'm going to focus on that because I'm not worried about who someone perceives me to be. I'm focused on what I'm supposed to be doing. My duty. Right. Yeah. That brings me perspective. Praise Allah for helping you grab that. Amen. This all helps understand why the man pleaser goes so hard. It actually helps further understand because he's overcompensating for his own sense of what righteousness is. Right. If you read Psalms of Psalms at the four verse three, please. And his hand is first upon him as though he acted in zeal. And yet he himself guilty in respect of manifold sins and a wantonness. So you can see in his mindset, he's being zealous by going hard on others or even going hard on himself. But it's deception. He's either trying to get over or he actually doesn't understand what true righteousness is because he's thinking it's zeal or trying to get you to think it's zeal. It's actually the pride, right? And overcompensation for his own secret sins that you can't see. So if you find you are hasty in judgment or quick to feel embittered or grieved at the shortcomings of others or lack compassion or pity on the shortcomings of others or quick to get offended when someone wrongs you or you feel you're wronged or it takes a long time to let stuff go that was done to you. And just honestly forgive from the heart and not allow the remembrance of offenses of the past to have an effect on you. That's not good. And also, if you deal with yourself in that same manner, that's not good. And if you do also find that you have your own secret sins that you aren't truly working on within yourself, if you had to be honest, though you may work on the outward stuff, or try to appear righteous to others, along with the lack of love to have compassion and mercy without partiality, it's the man-pleasing spirit of the spiritual fornication we're operating in, not being single-minded with hatred in our heart, helping us to stay in the man-pleasing. Instead of a single focus on our own heart and having compassion not to allow a reproach against our neighbor, or evil thought arise in our heart, nor to do or say anything that would set a stumbling block or occasion to fall in our brother's way, while not judging anyone, but being a doer of the law, by focusing on our own work. And as Zach just talked about, in every instance, just making sure 
we're focused on that one duty to be a doer of the law. And all these things we're talking about, I personally speak from experience, okay? When in this man pleasing spirit, another telltale sign is the wanton eyes. Looking at folks lustfully or desiring their validation or attention. We continue Psalms of Solomon chapter 4, verse 5, please. By night and in secret he sinneth, as though unseen. With his eyes he talketh to every woman of evil compacts. Okay. In his heart he lusts after women, where no one can see. And in secret he looks at them with desire, thinking of relations or relationships with them. As fornication is in his mind, being the same for women. Similar to Hermas, who looked at the woman lustfully and thought about having a relationship with her, which was the deceit trying to cover the evil thought he initially had. So it's like fantasizing about having the person or having pleasure with them in the mind. But remember, Allah sees everything, so he was reproved in the evil thought he really had. He didn't understand what he was doing, though as fornication doesn't help us understand. And he, speaking of Hermas, is a good testimony to see that we can come out of it because he didn't do it again after he understood not agreeing with the thoughts to let it enter it into his heart again. Let's continue learning about the man pleaser, please, in verse 4. His eyes are upon every woman without distinction. It's fornication and lust at work so it's upon every woman or for a woman would be every man or whatever struggle or indulgence a person may be in so it's fornication and lust at work and it's upon every woman that at least you'll look to size them up or see if there is some feature they have that's desirable the wantonness at work just at least wants to look and get its fill though it may not even be someone you necessarily are attracted to. But man-pleasing is a judge of the law, as we've been learning, so it wants to look and at least form its own opinion about the person. This desire at least to look can happen in, say, the grocery store or out and about, where you may notice somehow you catch a glimpse at every woman or every man in the vicinity. Or your eyes somehow may get in the right position to look at their body, which may seem coincidental, but it's really as the spirits at work are persuading you by your desires and aiding you to fulfill it, as they also want to be refreshed as well. When in the single mind, focused on our heart, not to admit any evil desire, we will be delivered from that lustful eye, catching the thought of temptation, so that we can see people in love or not desiring it in our heart to just shun the thought and keep away from the desire by putting your head down and being honest about what's attacking you to understand the battle you're in at the moment to be honest and calling on Allah for it not to enter into your heart. We want to get to the truth and love without a personal desire for them or outlook towards them, nor looking for opportunities to lust after others' beauty. That's a part of this that I feel is not very touched on. This man-pleasing is very, very dominant in women, and I'm going to explain how it happens a lot. When a woman is, let's say a woman is she has on, maybe let's say she has on a nice outfit or some nice shoes or whatever the case is. And another woman says, comes up and says, hey, you doing it, girl, or something along those lines or something to big up the other woman. It's the same spirit of men pleasing. Because they're checking the other woman out. It's the same thing. Yeah. Like, so it's, you can see how that same men pleasing is 
even in the woman's society, and it's not just towards men, it's actually towards other women too. And they and a lot of women actually push other women further into iniquity by complimenting the things that the other woman is doing that's evil, whether it be clothing or or uh, unseemly attire. They actually push other women further into iniquity. And it's the same hatred of heart and that men pleasing that actually causes them to do that. And I don't have to point that out. Hopefully that helps for sisters to understand what's going on. Now let's look at some cures for man pleasing. And it's gonna help with hatred and fornication and lust as well, right? Testament of Benjamin, chapter eight, verse two, please. He that hath a pure mind in love, looketh not after a woman with a view to fornication. For he hath no defilement in his heart, because the spirit of Allah resteth upon him. It's the idols in our heart when we look lustfully, unless it's a spouse or fiancé. And see that this man took the time to work and not let those idols enter his heart to get to the place where he could get the Holy Spirit because he had to keep the commandments together. So it's not something that's going to just happen like that. It takes work. We're going to have to put the work in to overcome those desires and pray to Allah to deliver us from the desires. And as we talked about in the situations where we feel the desire, to put our head down and be honest with Allah and stand still and get that help, all right? Testament is a God, chapter 4, verse 4, please. And the spirit of deceit have no power against him, for he looketh not on the beauty of women, lest he should pollute his mind with corruption. So in singleness, it is possible to see a woman without actually looking upon her beauty when looking at her, but just seeing a sister in all purity. Continue, please. There is no envy in his thoughts. No malicious person makes his soul to pine away. Because he isn't judgmental in love to get offended or embittered at others' weaknesses out of love. And understand, you know, remember when we talked about signs like those spirits to be envious about something or to be embittered about something it uh, helps the other spirits come in like if you find if you want to know whether you're in your feelings or not say you were doing fine and all of a sudden you feel a little bothered if you notice that want and eye coming along now you're seeing you're lusting after people time to sit down and regroup well if you see you're not settled Let's say it says no malicious person maketh his soul to pine away. If you see that you're not settled, that's actually your soul pining away. Yeah. So if somebody does something wrong to you and you're struggling with thoughts of doing something wrong to them or you're struggling with being angry or whatever the case is, your soul is pining away because of a malicious person. I mean, you took it, you took it personally and you didn't have compassion to see that they were struggling with something. Amen. So you got different indicators in the mind and in the body to know something you need to stop, okay? So he isn't judgmental in love, not to get offended or embittered at others' weaknesses out of love. All right, continue, please. Nor worry with insatiable desire in his mind he isn't anxious or upset, feeling grieved at the law because he can't fulfill his desire or wants to fulfill his desire to look or think about him or her. Okay. For he walketh in singleness of soul and beholdeth all things in a rightness of heart. Shunning eyes made evil through the error of the world, which he should see the perversion of any of the commandments of the Lord. See how his focus on the Lord in his heart, not to allow himself to let a thought in that would lead him to look at any person in his heart outside of the boundaries of the commandments, nor do anything outside of it, even in thought. 
that makes it possible to stay focused on the work. What we are talking about can happen for women towards men too. And honestly, the daughters of Zion will indulge in this man pleasing as they are prophesied to be haughty and have wanton eyes. So hopefully, if they notice these signs we are talking about in themselves, they can start praying to be delivered. And even if they see it in a sister, pray for her to be delivered. Mm -hmm. Or a brother, pray for him to be delivered. And recognizing the works of fornication, they can start working sincerely to come out of it, just like us men. And we got to be sincere and do this work. Can you read First Peter 2 and 2, please? As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. We got to sincerely desire the word for ourselves to change us within, not just change our outward show in deceit or critique another, but just for ourselves as babes out of love for our heavenly parents and true love for ourselves, I would add, to come out of the hatred. Being children for real, starting over, starting over and learning, starting over and letting go of whatever we may have thought righteousness was or what we would look like in righteousness but truly as children coming to Allah Hayyam to learn in his law and in his fruits daily in every moment just to see what his will is and to fulfill it and go into our counselors when we need understanding of how to fulfill it okay so we see we need sincerity in all this to come out of it. Can you read Sirach 5 and 11, please? Be swift to hear and let thy life be sincere and with patience give answer. Let our whole life be sincere, taking the time to stop when deceit is tempting us not to be genuine, when we have something going on within us to be hasty and act like we don't, or do whatever we think we have to to seem good by answering quickly with what sounds right or we think someone wants to hear or what won't offend them. Or acting like we think we must to look good in the moment or being silent in our evil thoughts. But being sincere, be patient to give answer, slow to wrath, slow to speak, and honest when we need a moment to regroup or get back to a tranquil, silent space within. Can you read James 1 and 19, please? Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. When you know you're not feeling right within, be genuine and be still and stop to correct the heart and do the action or speak genuinely. Psalms 4 and 4, please. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Shela. It can feel like a moment of awe where you're not even paying attention to your breathing. You got to catch it. Call upon Yache. Get your breathing back to calm your body and come back to peace in that silence of mind to be genuine. Continue, please. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in a higher. When you take the time to settle down and be genuine in humility, you're truly offering yourself as a living sacrifice to be a truly sincere person. Can you read Psalms 51 and 17, please? I'm going to give an example. Um, let's say that somebody was operating in pride towards you. Right. Instead of operating or taking on that spirit of pride and operating the pride back to them, you want to gather yourself so that you're actually dealing with them in love and genuine and genuineness so that they can actually see a different direction. They can actually see a different a different mode of action instead of somebody being angry and then somebody speaking back to them in anger. Or somebody being prideful and somebody speaking back to them in pride. We act supposed to gather ourselves and not render evil for evil so that we can actually come to 
and come back to the spirit of Elohim and not treat that person differently, though they may be treating us a certain type of way. But instead, upholding the righteousness of Elohim. There's a precept that explains that well, that we could probably help with this example. It's Ignatius to the Ephesians, chapter 10, verse 1. It says, And pray ye also without ceasing for the rest of mankind, for there is in them a hope of repentance, that they may find Allah Hayyam. Therefore, permit them to take lessons at least from your works. Against their outbursts of wrath, be ye meek. Against their proud words, be ye humble. Against their railings set ye your prayers. Against their errors be ye steadfast in the faith. Against their fierceness be ye gentle. And be not zealous to imitate them by requital. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you read 51 and 17 already? Mm -hmm. So if we really become the sincere person and work to get there for it not or continue striving to maintain being that sincere person Allah I am he'll really appreciate us can you read Psalms 51 and 17 please the sacrifices of Allah I am are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart O Allah I am thou would not despise it will bring Allah, I am near instead of far away from us operating in deceit and in the arrogance of fornication. Continue Psalms 34, 18, please. Ahaya is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. So let's take pleasure in the good inclinations and work at the inner change joyfully and cast the deceit and not turn back to the lust. All right. Asher, this testament of Asher, chapter 1, verse 6 to 7, please. Therefore, if the soul take pleasure in the good inclination, all its actions are in righteousness. Because when we delight in the will of Allah, that's what we will cleave unto and act upon in our thoughts. All right. And if it's sin, it's straightway repentive. For having its thoughts set upon righteousness and casting away wickedness, it straightway overthroweth the evil and uprooteth the sin. Hmm. He stops to deal with it when it enters his heart. Or he found he made a mistake. He doesn't hastily just go by it, but he deals with it. He reasons to uproot the sin from his heart. That's a righteous mindset of when an evil thought comes and happens to enter our heart, or we entertain it and realize we're entertaining it, or we acted upon it and realize what we did. Confess it and repent, asking the Lord to deliver us from it, or not let it enter our heart, putting our trust in him sincerely, and focusing on making sure we don't operate in it again, moving forward on growing in the faith temperately, not getting into our feelings for falling, as that's not genuine. If we're upset that we fell, when we know we are working on changing in the first place, so stumblings must come to grow. Neither going back to the thought that caused us to fall, to get upset about it or judge ourselves about it, because that's just a way of deceiving ourselves to go back into the lust or stay in the lust of it. Because when we go back to the thought after hastily passing over it, it starts to run in our minds again because we still desire it really. And the sorrow or guilt tripping just helps us do it deceitfully in the guise of not wanting it. But the fact that the thought's still running just shows that we are still letting it into our hearts. And this will help Zachwa talk to me about this. When you remember Lot's wife, 
If you read that verse, Luke 17 and 32, please. Remember Lot's wife. She looked back at her desires and her feelings instead of dealing with the desire she had at the first and putting it behind her and looking forward to plow away at growing. Taking things as good from Allah Hayyam. Verse 33, please. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. If we look back to what we want, or in this case, the faults that we stumble in along the way, or the things we lost or had to let go of because of the choice to keep the faith, it won't save us. But if we look forward to what we want to attain unto sincerely in Christ, taking experiences in stride to learn from, cast the faults up unto Allah in confession, and walk forward focused on the work to grow in listening better, to protect our heart, not to let the next evil thought in us, or to entertain it, or to go back to it, to give into the desire of it, we will be saved. Can you read Hebrews 10, verse 38 and 39, please? Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Faith comes by hand, so if we draw back to a bad thought to entertain it straightly, or to entertain it in guile, by sorrowing in it or judging ourselves about it, it's not living by faith in Christ. Can you read the next verse, please? But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. A hypocrite will draw back to the thought unto perdition because they have pleasure in it, and in their feelings they'll stay there, not growing. But them that believe will cast it off from them and not look back to it, putting it in Allah hands and learning from it and focused on the next listening session sincerely to be sure they are working rightly towards their sincere goal of being a good person from the heart. And all that helps understand that's the dichotomy of a hypocrite versus a sincere believer. The hypocrite will not overcome the inner struggle because by his deceit of only changing the outward show and dressing up the outward show as good, he never actually deals with the evil spirits within and they continue to cause him to indulge because of his pleasure in his desires and his concerns with pleasing men, not Allah Hayyam in truth. Can you read Testament of Asha 1 and 8, please? But if it incline to the evil inclination, all its actions are in wickedness, and it driveth away the good, and cleaveth to the evil, and it's ruled by Belial. Everything is wicked because none of it is genuine. And when the heart weighs on him, because he isn't being genuine, he will hastily drive the desire to be honest and genuine away, to act or say or do what's needed to please men and maintain that good image and deceit, cleaving to the evil, as that's what he's used to doing. And when in secret, he will indulge in his evil, when no one can see, or in his head and heart, he will cleave to it when no one can see, though Allah Hayyam is there seeing everything, though he doesn't believe it or may not understand it. Continue, please. Even though it worked that which is good, he perverteth it to evil. For whenever it beginneth to do good, he forceth the issue of the action into evil for him, seeing that the treasure of the inclination is filled with an evil spirit. There's the life of a man pleaser or an hypocrite, not doing even good things genuinely, because he desires vain glory when he does it to get the feelings of being liked or accepted by men, or he's doing it so he can gain something he desires for himself rather than singly just doing it for Allah Hayyam, because that evil spirit in his heart or inclination is still there because he isn't stopping to actually deal with his inner man. All right. 
Interesting. That just shows you that the true battle with the men pleaser and the hypocrite isn't isn't carnal. It's spiritual. Because they don't want to deal with the, the spirit inside. They don't want to deal with the they don't want to deal with the actual soul and the spirits that are affecting it. They only want to deal with the carnality of things. They want to deal with the things that that they feel don't require Alahayim. Because they trust in themselves. Because if they had to be, if they feel like they have to be complacent on anyone else, then that takes away from their pride or their power that they feel they have. And as you learn here, dealing with the inner man it's only Allah Haim that can help you. It's only Allah Haim that can deliver you. Because we're dealing with spiritual entities inside the heart and in the mind. Whereas this is carnal. Although you don't have no control, you can feel like you have control because you can move when you feel. You can move at, at will. But when it comes to the heart and the mind, you need Alahayim to be able to combat or to be able to overcome. And that takes away from the pride. That's true. That's where the envy plays in. There's an envy against Alahayim. Because I said envy, dis humility destroyed envy. Mm -hmm. So, and to understand when we're avoiding dealing with the soul and the inner man is the envy in us. Envy in that we have to submit to Allah in order to be changed. It's the same thing the devil did. His envy led him astray too. Hopefully that helps the perspective and knowing when we take the time to stop and deal with our inner man, we're actually choosing humility to destroy that envy. And we're reverencing Allah by choosing that humility. Now we gotta I think we got a good understanding for now of the man pleaser. And we'll talk about it at a later time, probably. Lord willing. But we also see a man pleaser also is a hypocrite. So let's look at a hypocrite to understand that, to be aware of it and help for our insight, for our growth. The righteous would focus on the inner man to get the evil spirits out of the heart and press forward in the work sincerely, choosing that humility. But a hypocrite will not walk in this way because of the pride, like we talked about, that obstinate heart. All right. Can you read Sirach 33 and 2, please? A wise man hateth not the law, but he that is a hypocrite therein is as a ship in a storm. Because of the hatred in his heart, because hatred and pride is hateful too, so you know it goes with it. Because of the hatred in his heart, when he hears the law, he gets emotional, like a ship in a storm. Seeing the parable that's being used, the storm is the evil spirits attacking him to get him away from hearing the law, to obey it or agreeing with it. And the rough sea is his lust, helping him agree with the spirits. And the environment of his mind is unstable in trusting in Allah and his law. Partly because it's convicting his secret sins in his heart. And partly because if he puts his trust in it, he'll lose what he or she desires to fulfill. And partly it's because it's not according to his standard of righteousness or his ideal self that he's formed in his mind. 
Being as a ship in water, tossed in the emotion of his desires, helps him stay right where he is. So you can see why he's as a ship in a storm, All right? It's with purpose, it's to not have to change. Notice he's as a ship tossed to and fro because he still has a desire in what he's doing. But when a man really wants to change, in the midst of the waves of desire and the storm of evil spirits, he puts his anchor down and stops the ship and prays to Allah Hayyam, the control of creation, so he can actually weather the storm in silence of mind and purity of heart, waiting on Allah Hayyam's deliverance to make the storm of spirits pass and calm the sea of desire to be a sober mind and not looking back to it, pressing forward on his journey to get to his destination. It's interesting. You can see, you know how, like, unfortunately in the world we've been taught whenever we're under attack, like, to be like, rebuke you, Satan, and, like, get all emotional about it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, like, that makes us to where we think we're actually fighting against the spirit. You know, Lord, Lord rebuke you, devil, da-da-da-da-da. When the scriptures show to keep silence and purity of heart and commune with your own heart, commune with Allah Hayyam in silence. You know, to reason with him and ask him to deliver from the thing, really not trust in him. And Isaac, Isaac exemplified it because when the devil tempted him, he didn't respond to him. He spoke straight to his father. It's not an outward show. So when in the midst of the storm, to put the anchor down and stop the ship. This is when a man is tempted or finds himself in his desires that he wants to overcome. He stands in awe, seeing it, that he's in his feelings or under duress. But instead of being hasty to cast it off or hasty to keep moving and not dealing with it, he stills himself, putting his anchor down to reason and deal with the desire and correct it or come out of it before moving forward so he can do the good deeds sincerely without anything different going on in his heart. That's what a just man would do, one that chooses humility to overcome the envy and what righteousness to overcome the hatred. But I see what a hypocrite would do. But the hypocrite would be offended thereat. That's Sirach 32 and 15. So on the other hand, the hypocrite won't put his anchor down to be still and silence his mind to come out of the desire and the deceit of acting like he isn't in a war or desire within. And he wouldn't pray genuinely. He may use vain words to beguile his own soul, but he wouldn't pray genuinely because fornication hinders the sacrifices of Allah Hayyam. When a hypocrite hears the law, when his faults are revealed, he gets offended in his feelings to see himself for who he truly is, instead of being thankful for the understanding because he really wants to change. Because of the double-mindedness still having his own desires within and hatred in heart, no matter how much he makes the outside of the cup look good to others, he will stay unstable in doing righteousness because he isn't honestly and sincerely working on his heart to deal with the spiritual things that's going on within him. James 1 and 8, please. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That unstableness is a simple way of knowing the man is still indulging in the spirit of fornication to give into his desires in his heart and his indicators of hypocrisy and man-pleasing. So things to pray for. And we understand these spirits not to look down on ourselves, but to understand what's going on, to know what's at work and know what we need to be praying for deliverance from. 
and what we need to work to overcome. The word unstable. It says the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The word for unstable is inconstant. Inconstant means frequently changing, variable or irregular. That, the spirit, angry temper, we're going to talk about her. That's whatever spirit that is. We're going to talk about it. It's one of Satan's children. It's, um, what is the word? Fickle. Fickle. Yes. Yep. Fickle. So the instability. All right. Can't be consistent. Constantly changing. Because there's the war within. There's two minds. I have what I want. And then at times I know it ain't right. And I'm trying to do what Allah Hayan wants. Mm -hmm. But then at times when I still want what I want. Mm -hmm. Like I still need my time. I still have my desires. So... Though that's how that can happen. And if anybody was wondering what I meant when I said the man wouldn't pray genuinely, the hypocrite wouldn't pray gen wouldn't pray genuinely. Genuine prayer is I really want to come out of this and I've settled down so I can pray to Allah Hayyam to be delivered, as opposed to I'm vainly talking, beguiling my soul, like, Lord, I don't want this. Don't let this be. But I'm in my feelings because the real desire is I do want this. So the thought is going to keep running because I'm, this is a thing where deceit is truly deceiving. We actually still want it. And that's why we're vexed. We're vexed because we either want it or we're vexed because we still see the desires there. We haven't overcome it yet. And that vexes us because that pride, that's not where we want to be. We're not content that Allah has me in this season to learn right now to, to stand against this. So we won't be temperate to genuinely pray and settle ourselves down. But it'll just be the words while we're entertaining the desire. It'll happen in the midst of it or after we're done praying. You'll notice the thought will come right back because we really didn't let it go. This is what we're talking about. We go back into the thought, did all that praying, and then I'm right back in the same lull again mm -hmm. because it was what I actually desired and my prayers weren't genuine. All right. You didn't actually cast it away from you. All right. Hopefully that helps understand that part. Now, hopefully this discussion today has been helpful in regards to listening, understanding how we listen and understanding how we take things in and what's going on and what's hindering us or who's hindering us from being able to take things in and work on what we need to work on. We're going to take this home stretch here to look at our focus. All right. So we got to just be honest within and with others and patient with ourselves to just work on making our hearts good. Can you read Luke 8 and 15, please? But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. And be content with our lot in the faith, not competing or comparing ourselves with anyone. Matthew 13 and 8, please. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. We all just have to bear the 12 Holy Spirit's garments it's faith, continence, power, long suffering. Simplicity, guilelessness, cheerfulness, purity, truth, understanding, concord, and love. 
That's the standard for all of us, okay? The standard for us all as a body of Christ, Yachi. Yet, there are some whom Allah will prosper to abound in certain respective fruits, maybe 60 or maybe a hundredfold, according to his will, like the apostles. Yet, it's just his will for strengthening and prospering the body, so comparing ourselves or competing to be better than another for first places or glory or an office is truly competing with Allah Hayyam's will to be exalted above it. So that's why we just have to focus on ourselves and be content with our lots. He gives us to bear the 12 at least. And when we see someone prospering more than us, praise Allah Hayyam and pray for their prosperity because... He is doing it for a reason, to convert souls. All right. Testament of God, chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, and verse 6, please. Right. Testament of God, chapter 7, verse 1. If a man prospereth more than you, do not be vexed, but pray also for him, that he may have perfect prosperity. For so it is expedient for you, for the poor man, if... Free from envy, he pleaseth the Lord in all things, is blessed beyond all men, because he hath not the travail of vain men. So that's God given further understanding of how to choose humility to overcome envy. Taking the humility, the humble route to work on what's within us, and also the humble route to bless and pray for prosperity of others who may be doing well. And all of this is expedient for us because it's going to draw us near to Allah Hayyam or keep us near to Allah Hayyam. Think of the poor man as the humble, as he will have everything he needs in the fruits of the Spirit if he is free from envy, sincerely working on himself and doing what's right for Allah Hayyam's sake from the heart, sincerely, not to please men and gain them on the outside, but just to please Allah Hayyam and his Lord. Not worried about how others will perceive him or her, but only with a view of, is this pleasing to Allah Hayyam or not? Speaking all this from experience, any vexation at the prosperity of another is hatred and envy, and the tactic to stay right where we are in our feelings, looking at someone else's walk, not overcoming our own man-pleasing or hypocrisy, or any other indulgence in the society of Satan's family. Can you read Testament of Gats at the 4 verse 4, please? For hatred worketh with envy, also against them that prosper. So long as it heareth or seeth their success, it always languisheth. So don't let our hearts be deceived to think it's anything besides hatred and envy along with the jealousy that dwells in the lust of fornication, at the root of getting in our feelings when we see folks prospering or entertaining thoughts that lift us up over them, or hate on what they're doing, or desiring ourselves to be on their level or better than them, instead of just striving to perfect ourselves and blessing that person and praying for their prosperity. To be perfected, praying for their perfect prosperity. We got to be mindful of a hypocritical mindset and reaction to change and focus to listen in humility to the right angel in our thoughts and let our own words be in cheer and faith optimistically that change is possible with Allah Hayyam so we can be accepted of him. Can you read Psalms 19 and 14, please? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Ahaya, my strength and my redeemer. We started early in this where we talked about we need to be asking Allah, I am search me, seek me, see if there's anything going on in me. And also we need to ask him, let my thoughts and my words actually be what's acceptable to you. Strengthen me in that. You see how everything is literally dependent on Allah, I am. Okay. This way of doing and thinking will keep us positive as we go through the changes we need to learn and grow in the law. Psalms 119, verse 71, please. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, 
that I might learn thy statutes. So eventually we will get to where he needs us to be with this understanding, mindset, and perspective to do the work, seeing the product of our labors. Psalms 119 verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. So let's work putting our trust in Allah with joy, knowing eventually we will get to where we actually keep his word. Sirach 30 and 22. <laughs> the gladness of the heart is the life of man, and the joyfulness of a man prolongeth his days. How we take things in our heart and our mindset makes all the difference in prospering in this walk. Love thy own soul and comfort thy heart. Remove sorrow far from thee, for sorrow hath killed many, and there is no profit therein. And we will know we really love ourselves when we cast off the sorrow to let the fruits of the Spirit in our hearts in the process. Envy and wrath shorten the life, and carefulness bringeth age before the time. So see and understand that anxiety of wickedness, wrath, and envy is at work in bringing us down in emotions, not being joyful to endure that process with cheer to build patience. And now knowing this, let us take heed to what we're exhorted to do. In James 1 and 2, please. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So that's a rule for us, to count it all joy when the diverse temptations come, the different spirits come with their attacks. Count it all joy. It's a blessing for us because it's helping us. It's helping us work patience. Now, hopefully you understand why we ought to just have joy as the trial is just to grow and build patience. So be cheerful, not anxious, knowing we need to go through it to get where Allah wants us to be. And when we have the right mind, all the experiences actually help us grow in the fruits. The definition of patience is cheerful and hopeful endurance, constancy, enduring patience, patient continuance, waiting, so that separates us from the instability. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you see what we should be growing in is chair and hope in our endurance. As we get more experiences and whatever comes, don't get anxious. We just cast the cares on Allah in thanksgiving, trusting he will fulfill his work. Philippians 4 and 6, please. Be careful for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. As he didn't give us the spirit of fear, so let nothing justify anxiety as wickedness. She operates in that. Right? Continue if you. Anxiety comes from doubt. Sure. Doubtful mindedness, the daughter of the devil. Right. So be faithful. Knowing Allah is going to do it, Allah is going to do. And if you find yourself feeling anxious, go pray and, and breathe and gather yourself and come back to Allah. I, am. I find myself having to do that sometimes. I'll sit there and pray just to gather myself and breathe so that I can get myself back at peace. But you don't want to go forward anxious. And then calling it out, calling out that doubt and saying, hey, that's doubt. Okay, Allah, I am. Put on, help me put on faith and breathe until you get to that place where you actually are sound, you know. So. Thank you. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto Allah. I am. It comes right what she said. Mm -hmm. That's humility and trust. All right. First Peter 5 and 6. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of Allah, 
that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. He will exalt the poor and humble who are slow, taking their time depending on him to give them ability out of iniquity in due time. In the meantime, waiting on him to strengthen, we just have to focus on not letting lust arise and lead us in any matter of our life so we can be sincere, being content with Allah Haim at all times because we trust them. Hebrews 13 and 5, please. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That simplicity and singleness toward Allah Hayyam makes life really simple so we can finally be at peace in our hearts and minds and not allowing covetousness to lead our mind into a frenzy, truly trusting in Allah Hayyam to provide all things. Yeah. Don't be looking for things. Don't be, don't set your heart on things that you don't have. If Allah is going to give it to you, he's going to give it to you. But focus on the things that you have and take care of the things that you have. That will focus you on your labors, just like Reuben said. He said, focus on your labors. If you focus on what Allah has already given you and, and perfecting it or building it, then you're not going to be focused on what you don't have or desiring something else that can actually cause you to fall. Because it may not be what Allah wants for you. So the things that you do have, you know Allah wants them for you because you have them. Build, use them. You know, build them up. All right. Simplifying the focus. In Philippians 4 and 7, please. And the peace of Allah which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Yache. Through Yache in us, he will give us peace in heart and mind to be sincere, simplistic, and content with his will, trusting them in everything, focused on our duty of just making sure we obey in their voice. Genuinely. Be at peace in Allah Hayyam, and no spirit or person can take away our joy in them. Proverbs 14 and 10, please. The heart knoweth his own bitterness, and a stranger doeth not in a meadow, in a middle, in a meadow. Yeah, I messed that one up. You had it right the first time. I know. <laughs> the heart knoweth his own bitterness, and a stranger doeth not in a middle, meadow. Uh, the heart knoweth his own bitterness, and the stranger doeth not in a meadow with his joy. It's facts. And you see how, like, when a person's where they're at, you can't change it. Just as when a person's in bitterness, you're not changing that. They have to choose to change it. Mm -hmm. Just as when a person truly is in joy, no stranger, nobody can affect that. So when we get to where we truly have joy in Allah Hayim and just the simplicity of his lifestyle and what he commands, nobody can take that joy away. As he actually said, that you may have joy and your joy may be full. It's fulfilling for us when we get there. We have to choose to take things in joy and look at things joyfully so we can be in a good space always while we grow. If you read Hebrews 12, verse 11 to 15, please. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Exactly. I talked about this way. We might grieve at first, but eventually it's going to come to fruition and it's going to bring forth the fruit. Right. Yet, you can take it joyfully if you choose to. Right. And it would be joyous throughout the whole process. All right, continue, please. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, 
least that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Look in diligently, lest any man fall of the grace of Allah, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Be strong and joy, family. Remember the Lord entrusted us with his spirit, and we have the duty to guard it, and we can actually do it because he himself did it as a man like us, trusting in his father to show us we can do it too, trusting in him as he trusted. And his father is in him, so the father will be with us too if we are servants in humility. Let's look at what, what Yache did in Hermas Parable 5, chapter 5, verse 5, please. Say on, saith he, if thou desireth anything, wherefore, sir, say I, is the son of Allah represented in the parable in the guise of a servant? Listen, saith he, the son of Allah is not represented in the guise of a servant, but is represented in great power and mastership. He's showing us as a humble servant is actually powerful and master over evil spirits by his long suffering and understanding. Continue, please. How, sir, say I, I comprehend not. Because, saith he, Allah planted the vineyard, that is, he created the people, and delivered them over to his son. The father gave him his children, of all nations, as Christ said, all are thine, and thine is mine. Okay. And the Son placed the angels in charge of them to watch over them. So Christ placed his angelic children to watch over Allah children in the world. All right. And the Son himself cleansed their sins by laboring much and enduring many toils. For no one can dig without toil or labor. Mm -hmm. Having himself then cleansed the sins of his people, he showed them the paths of life, giving them the law which he received from his father. Thou seest, saith he, that he is himself Lord of the people, having received all power from his father. Yacha is Lord of all people that serve him obediently, listening to him in love and call upon him, as his father desires. Continue. But how that the Lord took his son and the glorious angels as advisors concerning the inheritance of the servant, listen. The holy pre-existent spirit which created the whole creation, Allah made to dwell in the flesh that he desired. This is speaking of the Holy Spirit dwelling in Yache when he came as a man into the world. This flesh, therefore, in which the Holy Spirit dwelt, was subject unto the Spirit, walking honorably in holiness and purity, without in any way defiling the Spirit. When then it had lived honorably in chastity, and had labored with the Spirit, and had cooperated with it in everything, behaving itself boldly and bravely, he chose it as a partner with the Holy Spirit. For the career of this flesh pleased the Lord, seeing that as possessing the Holy Spirit, it was not defiled upon the earth. He therefore took the Son as advisor, and the glorious angels also, that this flesh too, having served the Spirit unblameably, might have some place of sojourn, and might not seem to have lost the reward for its service. For all flesh which is found undefiled and unspotted, wherein the Holy Spirit dwelt, shall receive a reward. Notice this for everybody. He just set the standard to show it as possible. Mm -hmm. So all of us shall receive a reward if we don't defy the Holy Spirit when we receive it, because we are keeping the commandments with the fruits of the Spirit that come forth with it. And it is possible not to defile it because Yache didn't defile it. And it's going to be him in us to keep us 
And it's him getting us where we need to be now to get ready to receive the Spirit when our hearts are ready to serve in sincerity and humility. So we have to stir up ourselves in faith and joy with this slogan when we need it. Philippians 4.13, please. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And no, when we believe this, we are really believing in his Father, who makes it all possible. Mark 10 and 27. For with Elohim, all things are possible. That's the fact. No matter what men may think or believe. Mark 27, the rest of it, please. And Yahweh looking upon them says, With men it is impossible, but not with Elohim. So if we believe in Elohim and the man, Christ Yahweh too, all things are possible for us, as he is our Lord and the son of the living Elohim. Luke 8 and 27. I'm sorry, Luke 18 and 27, please. And he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with Elohim. So, take courage and believe any hurdle or weakness we have. Though the lust of the flesh might try to deceive us to think it's not possible to change, speak truth with Elohim that it's not us alone at work, but our Lord and our Elohim at work in us so it is possible, and work with joy. Knowing they are doing the work and with us, don't let anything or any experience deter us from the hope and belief that change will come nor let it deter us from working in that hope and belief can we close out with romans 8 verse 31 to 39 please what shall we say to these things if allah am before us who can be against us he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of Elohim which is in Christ Yahweh our Lord. It is possible if we are persuaded as Paul was. He was in the moment just focused on doing the will of Allah. He didn't believe anything could deter him. All right. Allah be with us all and encourage our hearts to focus and work with cheer. Hope this is edifying. Hope this is helpful and strengthened us to do the work. Amen. All right. Make sure you guys, if you like the content, please definitely like and subscribe so that you can definitely get our um, updates of our new videos. Um, please check out the website, www.hebrewreaders.com. And we love you guys. Praise Allah. Amen. Chalam. HRC, 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 HRC,